Lunch Hall on the UC Berkeley campus, where Professor Matt Pyle will guide us through his lab, engage us in understanding mysterious dark matter and why we care, and give us an up-close view of the extraordinary experiment his group is conducting. I'd like to say a few introductory words about Matt Pyle. He received his undergraduate degrees in physics and aerospace engineering from the University of Notre Dame and went on to do his graduate studies and receive his doctoral degree at Stanford University. We're so very pleased that he crossed the bay all the way over to Berkeley for a postdoctoral research appointment with Bernard Satellet's particle cosmology group. And he joined the Berkeley physics faculty as the Garland assistant professor in 2015. Throughout the tour, we invite you to post questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. The questions will be moderated and as time permits, we'll do our best to address your questions. With that, let the tour begin. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Rachel. So uh, welcome everyone. So very quickly before anything else and I show you my lab, I'm gonna introduce you to a few people in, in my lab. Of course, because of COVID pro protocols, we can only keep one person in each room at a time. So, but I wanted to introduce you to a research scientist who has been working with me for the last 10 years. So very quickly. Okay, so here's our, our second room. And so Bruno, you wanna wave? So this is Bruno Surfass. He's a research scientist in my group and uh, he's been working on uh, Super CDMS as well as my new experiment, Spice and Herald. Uh, with me for I, 10, 15 years. So, hi. Everybody. Uh, hi. Uh, and you know, it's nice that he's working hard tonight. So, okay, check guys. I'll be back in this room in a little bit to explain what's happening there. But now, um, I'm gonna shut this camera off. My laptop. Second here. Sorry. Uh, audio. Sorry, I may have to. Okay. Technical glitch. So Matt, you are still muted, just so you know. I think you just have to turn off the volume on your iPad. Yeah. That's just... I was... That solved the problem. I believe it. It's always the struggle of having two screens. It should be off. Yeah, I think that works now. I'll just leave. Okay, and I'll I'll, I'll return when we swap over. Uh, okay, that that works. Sorry, sorry about that, guys. That was a little bit of a glitch. Um, okay, so here you're sharing. Let us. Okay, so uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. Um, talking about the, the search for dark matter. And hopefully you guys will be able to pin, uh, if, if you guys can pin me and like expand my, my, the size of my, of my screen for the viewers, that would be awesome. So uh, let's talk a little bit about solar system dynamics and why we think dark matter is out there. So uh, you guys all know that the earth revolves around the sun and so if you think about uh, what I have here, this is basically, uh, think of the ball as the earth and uh, think of the string as basically the gravity from the sun. Uh, of course, gravity cannot uh, end up twisted around itself like this has. And so it may destroy this entire demo, but uh, we'll see, ah, this is good enough. Okay, so if you see here, so think of gravity as, as a string again, the string tension. And you can see how uh, the earth is always being pulled towards the sun. And yet 
it overshoots and it comes back. And that's why the earth circles around the sun. And it's always being pulled towards the sun with the force of gravity. And that's the, the centripetal acceleration. And we can just do some very simple math. We can write that centripetal acceleration as mv squared over r. And then some algebra, we find that uh, the velocity of the, of the planets around the sun should scale as one over the square root of r. And that's actually what I've plotted here on the right, which is uh, you see all the planets and you see the distance from the sun. And you see that the, the velocity, which is in the y-axis, you see it perfectly follows this one over square root r law. And now the solar system, and you'll see this in physics all the time, that we use the same idea over and over again. And so this idea of the, the planets going around the sun is exactly what we see in a galaxy. So a galaxy is just a huge number of stars. And those stars are rotating around the, the center of the galaxy and are being pulled towards the center of the galaxy by the mass of the galaxy. And so that same rule should apply. It's the same derivation. And it's just that we expect that once you're outside of this core, where the vast majority of the stars are, if I look at those stars that are very far out and I look at them versus radius, they should follow this one over square root R law. And this is something we can just, we can just measure. And we find in observation, which now I've plotted in red on this curve, we see we don't see this one over R, uh, square root R law. Instead, we see that these farther out of stars, uh, they have a constant velocity, okay? And so this is, there's one of two things that could explain this. One is, is we don't understand gravity at large distances. And uh, the law that uh, Newton came up with in the 1600s doesn't apply. And then the second thing is, is maybe there's actually dark matter out here, which is also helping to pull in those stars, just like this string on this, on this ball, and it pulls it in and makes those stars, those far out stars go faster and faster. So those are the two hypotheses we have. And so which one is it? Well, there's a few ways we can tease this out. One is, is that if it was a change in the law of physics at high radius, at, at, at large distances, then we would expect that law of physics would be the same everywhere. So every galaxy, should have that same turnover. And we see that's not actually true. We see that different galaxies have different heights in those far out uh, high radius stars, like different velocities compared to the amount of light uh, that they produce. And the light is proportional to mass in the center of that star. So that suggests that maybe it's not um, uh, due to a change of, of, of the law of Newton's gravity, but uh, there's another one here. There's another experiment we've seen, and that is the bullet cluster. So the uh, a cluster now is a bunch of, of 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 galaxies. So it's that one more level up. We went from a solar system, which was planets spiraling around a uh, a star, to a galaxy, which is stars uh, spiraling around a bunch of stars in the center, and then now we're at clusters, which are just like bunches of galaxies spiraling around each other. And uh, what we see here is this was a unique opportunity that we observed. And it was two clusters collided with each other. And we can measure the mass of that cluster independently of where the light is. And the light here is shown in red. It's been falsely colored to be shown in red. And where the mass is was shown in blue. And they're not located at the same part. So if you think of this as like a car crash in which Two cars slam together, and that's the red part. The red gas hit each other, and they stopped, and they slammed together, and they created all this heat. And then the blue, which is where all the mass is, just went right through, and it was like a ghost. So it just went right through the other one. And that's and the, the where all the light was got separated from the mass. And this is something that is incredibly hard to explain with a modified Newtonian gravity. So this, I think, is the, the gold standard for there must be dark matter. And dark matter causes uh, what we saw in, 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 our, in our own galaxy. OK, so uh, real quickly, uh, if you want to know how we actually measure 
where the mass is. It's actually with this idea of gravitational lensing. And it's with this idea that light can get pulled and twisted around uh, and, 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 and curved well, by gravity. Okay, so it's a very special relativistic concept. And you can see some pictures of, of actually the light being lensed by some massive object here, and you get all these artifacts. It's like curvature artifacts. So uh, I want to talk a little bit more. So now we know dark matter exists. We know it interacts gravitationally. But I, I want to talk about why we call it dark matter. And uh, I think the best way to think about this is uh, to think about what we mean when we think of like light reflecting off of a mirror. So down here, I have a light beam and it reflects off of a mirror. And what is happening physically in that mirror is that that light is coming in and uh, that electromagnetic field of the light makes those uh, charges wiggle up and down. So the electrons in that mirror surface, they start to wiggle and that wiggling then produces a wave that goes backwards and that wave is produced, it magically uh, cancels out the wave inside the metal over here, and it produces a backwards wave over here. So when you think of what is happening when you look at yourself in a mirror, you really need to think of every time light hits that mirror, there's electrons wiggling up and down and producing light and canceling the light that came towards it. And that happens because the electrons are, are accelerated back and forth by that electric field. So, this is a, so the idea of reflection is really this idea of light interacting with electrons. And it does that because electrons are charged. And likewise, the way we create light is again, by wiggling those charges I just talked about. And this is actually how a radio works. So here I have this radio antenna and we're kicking electrons back and forth and accelerating them back and forth. And that is creating this, uh, the, this electric wave, okay? So when we create, so when we scatter light, when we create light, it's all about fluctuating electrons. And, and that's because electrons are electrically charged. So when we say dark matter is dark, what we're saying is it doesn't scatter light. What we're saying is it doesn't create light. And that means at a fundamental level, we're saying it's not charged via uh, the electromagnetic force. It has no electric charge, okay? So, now the same is true that we can say there's no strong force interaction and it's not strong charged under the strong force because again, it's dark. It would just bang into us and we would be able to see it. So when we say it's dark, it's actually this very deep concept that it's not charged under all of these forces that define the world that, that we know. Uh, it's only the only force we've so far seen is, is, is gravity that it interacts with it. Okay, so now I wanna go a little bit into the history of the universe to explain why we feel it's there. And so uh, the universe started out with a big bang, as you know, and at that time, the universe was incredibly hot. And then since then, the universe has been cooling. And I had two demos to show this, but unfortunately neither one works virtually. Uh, so we're going to, to skip that aspect. But uh, just remember the universe at the early universe was incredibly hot. And what that means is think about that burner you have at home or think about a, a flame that when things are hot, they turn red, right? And then if they get really hot, they start to turn blue. And what does this mean? This means that uh, particles, photons, so light is actually being created via that random uh, thermal energy. So temperature is random thermal energy. So again, we have that random energy means those electrons are sort of bouncing around and creating light and they're absorbing light. So you, in the world you know, when you look at that red burner, you should think of that at a, some, some fundamental microscopic level, particles, photons, are being always created and annihilated. And the hotter the temperature, the more photons are created and annihilated. And so now take that intuition and think about what's happening in the early universe. Not only can, particle, can photons, which are massless, be created, but all these particles that we now see today were created and annihilated, even massive particles. So protons and antiprotons are just spontaneously made, and even larger particles. And this is the idea that, that actually dark matter, thermally generated dark matter, was produced in this way. 
in that hot early universe, Doc Matter was just was, was just made thermally. It was just excited thermally. Okay. So um, now the, the final thing I want to talk about is during this cooling down process of the universe, we had condensation. And so as things cool, uh, they condense. And you see that with water vapor. If you put a bunch of, of water in the air and then it gets cold, those water mo molecules, so this is, uh, I see these little Mickey Mouses up here on the right, they, they start to interact with each other and they get pulled towards each other and they start to clump. And that's water. So when they're hot, the, the, the this force of attraction between them uh, is, is not strong enough to pull them together and make a water droplet. But as they cool down, then suddenly these two water mo mo molecules can come together and attract each other. And then those can attract another one. And this is how you make a water droplet. So we see condensation in our world. So think about that now as in the early universe, as a universe is cooling down, we're condensing. And so here I'm actually showing big bang nucle nucleosynthesis, but it's just a condensation process. So now you guys hopefully all have intuition because you've watched rain happen. And so we started out with a bunch of hydrogen uh, atoms and then, and, and some neutrons. And then it would, at the early universe, it was too hot, but as they cool down, these two hit each other and they condense and they get stuck. And then those two, and that makes deuterium. And then those two then uh, pull in another proton and it makes helium three. And then they pull in another neutron and it makes helium four. And at the same time as this condensation is occurring, because now the universe is very cold and you're saying there should be no hydrogen left. At the same time as that condensation is occurring, the universe is expanding. So if that condensation occurs really, really quickly, then we should have lots of helium and we should have very little hydrogen, very little deuterium left over. By contrast, if, as a, if the universe expands so rapidly that those two hydrogens can't find each other, they can't hit each other, they just keep on passing by, then you won't make that much deuterium and you'll get a, a lot of hydrogen left over and a lot of deuterium left over because you can't make helium three and et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, the more mass you have, the more hydrogen you have, the more neutrons you have, the more likely they are to bang into each other. And therefore, the more likely you are to make helium-4. And this is a simulation of that shown here on the right. And we have uh, the x-axis is basically the percentage of total mass of the universe, which is dark matter. And then the y-axis is uh, the relative fraction of these particles like helium-3, deuterium, uh, uh, versus helium four, and you see that if we have lots of lots of uh, of the universe's energy in in matter in protons and neutrons, uh, then we would expect um, that uh, that we would see very little deuterium. And this was an experimental measurement. I, I'm sorry, uh, uh, but if we see uh, less uh, no, then we would expect to have uh, more deuterium. So what we see here is we see something like percentage of the total mass of, of the universe in, in protons and neutrons. And that's the stuff that we're made of is something like 20%. So this tells you that 80% of the mass that's currently in the universe today can't be protons and neutrons, can't be the stuff that we're made out of. It's something else. So just this alone is, is this idea that uh, dark matter is exotic. It's, it's not the stuff we're made out of. And we know that from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So we also know all this. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I have one more slide. And then we can start talking about what I really do in my lab and now that we understand what dark matter is. Um, so there's one final thing. I showed how dark matter is responsible for why uh, for how for how our galaxy for why stars spiral around our galaxy as fast as they do, um, but dark matter was also responsible for the entire structure that was developed in our universe, and this is again something that we've done with simulations. But in the early universe, uh, which I'm showing here on the left, this was uh, back when we see this last picture. This is an observ observation of the cosmic microwave background. And this is when the universe was hot enough such that 
protons and electrons didn't make hydrogen. They were still ionized. They, the, the electrons hadn't condensed onto the protons yet. And so that meant that uh, I, the, the particles were just, uh, everything was thermalized and, and you couldn't see, photons couldn't travel. And then right when the universe got cool enough that the electrons started to condense onto that proton, then suddenly those photons could free stream. And the first order, when we look, we see those photons coming all the way towards us from back at that era of last scattering. So we look back in time uh, with, with these telescopes and we can see what happened at the, at the time when the universe uh, just stopped being uh, uh, ionized. And we look at the universe, look in all directions, and we see that the universe is incredibly homogenous. So this is a color spectrum, the red versus blue. And you're gonna get that as like delta T over T. And the fractional difference between the red and the blue is something like 10 to the minus five. So it's incredibly homogenous. And now look at today. Today we have, uh, uh, here are all of these, all this structure. We have these huge, uh, 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 somehow we've gone from this homogenous universe to having all the mass in certain areas, right? So we have all these clusters and we have all the mass in a tight area and then we have huge amounts of empty space, okay? And that delta M over M, this fractional like uh, structure we have is something like 10 to the seven. So we had 12 orders of mag magnitude of structure formation. And uh, you can't get that uh, with, with, with having uh, without having dark matter be cold. And the idea is, is this, like if you think of how a rocket works, you can put about the escape velocity of a rocket, is that it, no matter what the mass of the rocket, if it has a certain velocity, then it can get away from the, uh, from the earth and it can go up to the moon. So that's this escape velocity. And uh, so if things are, are, can have, have high velocities and they have high kinetic energy, then they can escape and they can get out of a gravitational clump. So if we want to create clumping and we want all of that mass to be gravitationally attracted and condensed, we can't have these particles have high velocities. They have to be cold. And so that's the final thing we know about dark matter. And this is honestly all we know about dark matter. We know it's massive. We know it interacts gravitationally. We know it's dark. We know it's not the stuff we're made out of. It's not protons and neutrons. And we know it's cold, okay? And this is all from observation. So uh, finally, uh, I haven't ever mentioned cosmic microwave background, except for that the it's very homogenous. But this is really the era of precision cosmology. And uh, we look very, we look in detail at these maps, at this red versus blue. And it tells us that we have this theory of how the universe grew. And uh, it's amazingly accurate, it's amazingly precise. And it's only in the last 30 years or 20 years that we've had this capability to really think about how the universe grew. So this is, means that everything I just told you has now been confirmed in this very precise way by looking at the details of the cosmic microwave background. So we know dark matter must exist now. We know uh, what we know about it, the first order. So why do we care about it so much? And there's a lots of reasons why we say this. Well, first, it makes up 25% of the energy of the universe. And you know, it's five times more the energy of the universe than the stuff that makes up us, the stuff that makes up all the stars in the universe, all the protons and neutrons, that's only 5% of the universe. So it's, it's, in that sense, it's just a large fraction of, of, what is, of what the universe is. And therefore we say, well, we should understand it. But secondly, dark matter is the one particle that we know of, that we know must exist, that we haven't played with. And the hope is, is that studying dark matter will tell us about uh, everything else in maybe this dark sector, in this other area, all these question marks down here. If we can understand and play with dark matter, maybe it'll tell us about what these other particles are that we haven't seen yet. And it'll tell us how these particles interact with the, the, the particles that make up what we are. And hopefully it'll tell us 
the laws of physics that sort of are at higher energy scales and determined the, the fact that, you know, the, the dark matter had some mass that was, this, that was this level and had some spin and why, and why the neutron has uh, a mass of a one GV. So the hope is, is that by exploring dark matter, we'll get this key to understanding both the dark sector and also like all the laws of physics of high energy. That's sort of the dream. Okay, so now let's get into my lab. And um, so um, there's lots of different ways to search for dark matter. One is uh, to have an accelerator and you bang two of our particles together and you try to create dark matter. One is to look for dark matter out in the sky, which hits each other and then annihilates and creates particles that we can see. And this is very rare because again, it doesn't interact via charged particles. So it doesn't create photons very easily. Then finally, there's what I do in which I look for dark matter to interact and scatter off of a, a crystal or off of, some, uh, or off of some kind of material that we have. And again, this is very rare because it, it's dark. It doesn't interact via charge. It doesn't interact via the strong force. So it's a once in a blue moon event. Okay. So uh, one thing that I said was, we don't actually know the mass of dark matter uh, and in fact, there are theories that dark matter could be, you know, over a huge range of, ma range of masses. Like I have 10 to the minus 22 to 10 to the 48 GeV, right? Uh, and then that's a plus, plus, plus a nine. So, you know, there's like 70 orders of magnitude of mass that I have on this plot uh, that dark matter could be in some sense. And uh, experimentally, Lots of different groups are searching for dark matter at all different scales. Uh, the dark matter that I'm going to search for is something like between 100 milliV, which is uh, you know something like uh, 10 to the minus eight uh, uh, of an electron, so 10 billionth of an electron's mass, all the way up to something like the mass of a proton or the mass of 10 protons. So that's the range that I look for. It's a huge order of magnitude you know, it's something like 12 orders of magnitude of mass, right? So, uh, but that is my, it's sort of like going to Vegas. Uh, there really is no good way to say, does dark matter have a mass of 10 to the minus, I don't know, 16 EV, or does dark matter weigh one KV? We don't really know. And so uh, I've just bet my career that uh, it is going to be in this range here. And that is, you know, that's literally like going to Vegas and just uh, putting all your money down on blue or, or, or something, right? It's, it's, uh, and, but luckily other scientists in the world are putting their money down on, on other things. So the idea is that together uh, we cover the entire space. That's sort of the goal. Uh, of course, I, I hope I'm, I'm right. Uh, so uh, now we're going to get into my lab and uh, we can finally start to, to, to play with, uh, and you can start to look and ask me questions in the lab. So uh, what is the challenge of, of searching in my, in, in my lab for dark matter of this scale? And the biggest challenge is actually not that, so here I have this little, in my range, the nucleus, you know, it, the dark matter is basically much lighter and has less mass in the nucleus. So you should think of this as, a scattering of dark matter off of the nucleus is akin to like throwing a bouncy ball against the wall. So uh, the wall doesn't suddenly, when the ball, when that bouncy ball hits the wall, the wall doesn't suddenly jump back. The wall basically stays still and the ball keeps the majority of the kinetic energy and comes back towards me, right? So that's the problem is that when this really light dark matter scatters off of this big nucleus, only a very small amount of kinetic energy is given to the nucleus. And that's what I have to see. And that kinetic energy scales as the dark matter mass squared. So as I go to smaller and smaller masses, as I go from one GV down to one MeV or down to one KV, my, the, the size of that recoil gets much, much, much smaller. And so if you think about that, the, for dark matter that has the mass of a proton, the, 
the energy given to that nucleus is something like 10 to the minus 17 joules. And if you want to just think about what 10 to the minus 17 joules is, it's something like the amount of energy needed to lift a paperclip, one femtometer, which is one times 10 to the minus 15 meters. That's what 10 to the minus 17 joules is. Um, another measure of this is if you think about, I talked about temperature being random vibrational energy and like every atom in your table in front of you at your house is randomly vibrating. This is like the, the, the random vibrational energy of a thousand atoms. And you know, think about one human cell has something like 10 to the 14 atoms. That's how tiny this energy is that we're looking for. Okay, so that's really the big problem. And so the best question is how do we go about and solve this? And um, to measure this tiny vibrational energy, we basically are gonna make a calorimeter. And here I have an example of a calorimeter over here. I have a pot of water and I don't know, some dark matter comes in, scatters off that water particle and then bounces off and leaves a little bit of kinetic energy in that water. And then that will raise the temperature of that water. And you can say, oh, I saw that uh, dark matter. So why can you not make a dark matter detector at your home with a pot of water? It's an interesting question. And uh, the answer is, is that uh, it goes back to that random vibrational energy. So here in blue are all these nuclei in some crystal randomly vibrating around. And here in red is that energy that was put in, and that's the velocity that was given to this atom because uh, the dark matter scattered off of it. And so if these, if these things are all randomly vibrating around, uh, then we can't see this little red hit uh, because it gets lost in the, in the noise. So the key thing we wanna do is, is what? Does anyone want to just yell out what you guys think we should do? Uh, okay, I guess maybe not. Uh, but uh, so the key thing that we want to do, uh, you may not have been able to actually, or, or let's see, can I see a chat? Um, uh, no, okay. Anyway, the thing we want to do is we want to go to low temperature. So we want to take this crystal to absolute zero, or as close to that as possible, so that these blue, so that these things are frozen, they're stuck, they're not moving at all, and then we can see this red arrow because it's not lost in the in the noise. And so this is the reason for this giant dilution refrigerator behind me. So this dilution refrigerator gets us down to. 10 millik above absolute zero. So uh, I wrote what that is. That's minus 459.66 degrees Fahrenheit. And I want to talk a little bit about how this dilution fridge works. And, and then we can uh, go through and talk about it. And so the way I'm going to do that is uh, here. So what is this? It's, it's actually also Michael Jordan. So, so here I have, I'm gonna talk about evaporative cooling. So why when Michael Jordan is running around and he sweats to cool, right? And so what is sweat? There's water on the surface of your skin and uh, that water has random kinetic energy. And the hottest part of that water is going to be able to jump off and turn into water vapor. And that means that the remaining piece, the remaining water on your skin on average is cooler because only the hottest, the highest temperature atoms were able to jump off and evaporate. And so this is why we cool. And we're gonna see that in real life here. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm going to uh, take this setup. And I have some liquid nitrogen, which is already cold. And we're going to fill this up. Uh, I'm in a cryogenic lab and I don't have very much liquid connection. Now, there it is. Okay. So, and now I'm going to pump on it. I'm going to, I'm going to make it sweat, right? I'm going to make it evaporate. 
And I'm going to pump on it with a pump. You can hear. Hey, Matt, could we actually stop for a second? You could stop sharing your screen for a moment just so people can see better. Oh, yeah, sure. Cool. And so we're, we're evaporative. Uh, can you guys see that? Is that perfect? And we're going to see in a second. So this is, it is just like Michael Jordan sweating here. We're pumping uh, all of that water vapor off. So more and more water vapor comes. And it's just cooling down the remaining liquid nitrogen. And you're going to, so, you're going to see it slowly start to uh, settle down and become quiescent. And it's going to Do you see it? it? No, did you guys see that? Did you see it? Uh, it suddenly. Uh, did, you, did you guys see it turn to ice? Oh, we can't see you. Um, so, uh, who's, did everyone see it turn to ice there? Okay, awesome. So, can I turn this off? Is this possible? Okay, so that right there is is both how uh, Michael Jordan cools himself. It's how I just turn liquid nitrogen into solid nitrogen. And that's how this dilution fridge works. So inside this dilution fridge, and I'll take you actually to another dilution fridge of a, a, a colleague of mine, um, Dan McKenzie, whose is open, so you can actually see the inside. So this is the inside of another dilution fridge. Um, and uh, this right here is the still. Let's see what we have. We have the still, uh, the heat exchanger. This right here is our still. Uh, if you can see what I'm pointing to. Oh, that doesn't, ah, here. That's a little bit better. So this little spot here is, our, is a still. And what we're really doing here is we have helium-4, an isotope of helium, and it's a liquid. And we're pulling helium-3 out of it. And we're evaporating helium-3. We're pulling a vacuum on that line right there with a huge pump, with actually this pump uh, shown right up there. There's a big turbo pump. And I can tell you if you want how turbo pumps work in a second. But that is pulling a vacuum on the, on, on this, uh, on the still which pulls the helium-3 out and evaporates the helium-3. And that cools uh, this fridge down to something like 700 millik. And then here in the mixing chamber, it's again the exact same process. You know, if there's one thing I, I want to tell you, it's physicists reuse the same idea over and over again. And so here we're now pumping helium-3 from a helium-3 rich phase to a helium-3 dilute phase. by again, pulling on it. And so the way these really expensive dilution fridges work, and you know, mine costs $600,000, just as a, a casual aside, is really how Michael Jordan sweats. Uh, they're, they're, it's all the same. So uh, that is what you would hear, or, or that's what my fridge basically looks like on the inside, if it wasn't running right now and had detectors. So, um, so that is, that's the dilution fridge you see here. Uh, and here it's all buttoned up. And the pumps you hear uh, in the background, if you guys can hear the pumps. Uh, and this is where it would be nice if I switch. Let me see if I can switch super quickly to my iPad. It's just a little bit easier for me, but I'm not gonna connect the Ooh, meeting pass. Okay. I don't remember it. Um, 
give me one more second and then I can carry this around and it's just super easy for me to, uh, Hmm. Okay. Well, guys, I can't. Uh, we're just going to have to suffer through and use my. Ah. Mm, I can't find it in time. Uh, okay. We'll we'll have to stay with this, but I'll I'll go like this and hopefully you can see. So we see the pumps uh, here. So like that thing with the uh, at the very top. That is uh, another system that cools your four Kelvin. And then this line right here. This giant line here, this is the pump that pumps on the still that we were talking about earlier that pulls the helium three out of the helium four. So it pulls it up. And then on the other side of this wall is the, the turbo pump that is pulling the vacuum and pulling all that helium three out to cool down the still. So uh, the question is, is why do I put it on the other side of the wall? And We'll talk about that in just a second. So I'm going to go back. Uh, can you guys see my my screen again? Okay. So so far we're talking about dilution refrigerators. Uh, now let's talk about how we how we make that calorimeter. So we talked about how it was just basically a glorified thermometer. So our detectors are a little bit more advanced than that, but the idea basically holds. And so here is actually a detector that we've made. And I unfortunately can't see. So here, I'll, I'll, I'll remove the mirror. So here is um, a detector right there. And if I can here, I can actually, let me uh, stop sharing. And then I can hopefully see as well at the same time. Uh, okay, so there is a detector. It's a, a single crystal of silicon and it's hold, held in this copper housing. We have made all of this by, by hand. We've designed and fabricated this ourselves. And if you see on that silicon, you see these little circles and those little circles are aluminum or aluminum superconducting sensors. And here I'm going to attempt to bring this mic to bring this magnifying glass in. And Charlie, can you tell me when I've got the focal the the focal point well? Yep. Uh, oh, a little a uh, little more in. Uh, could you go down a little? Yeah. Oh, I can't tell if that's the. I think it's easier to see the circles because the room light. But oh, yeah, are there... you supposed to see a bunch of circles, basically? Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Is it? Is this? Is that actually easier? Um, a little. Yeah. Yeah. We see a bunch of circles. Yeah. Okay. So, have... yeah. in the center of each of those circles, is actually. So this is where there's this scale problem, and. Really, the next time we do a virtual lab tour, we're gonna have to buy a microscope that has like a a, a video, like a, a video where we can actually just see the image via the microscope. But let me share this again, and you can sort of see what that circle looks like. Oops, sorry. So uh, here is. So uh, here is that detector again. And this is one of those circles. And you see this line. I'm sorry, I'm going to expand this out so you can see it better. So this is one of those aluminum circles right there. And here is actually a nice picture you can sort of see. This is a different design, but you see each of those aluminum circles. And at the center of each of those lines is that calorimeter. So this is that little piece of thin metal which we heat up and its resistance changes and that's what we measure and so that is uh something like a micron long uh, a micron wide and a hundred microns long is that little thin thermometer and it's at the center of every one of those circles and then 
those aluminum circles you saw are actually absorbing athermal phonons that are bouncing around in the crystal. And they get absorbed uh, in this superconducting aluminum film. And it breaks this film is basically this idea of condensation again. Two electrons have condensed together and they interact. And we're using that athermal phonon vibrational energy to break them apart. And then we diffuse those two electrons over to this calorimeter where they drop their energy and they heat up that really tiny TS, that, that really tiny thin metal line. And that, and we make in, in our group, basically the world's most sensitive uh, thermometers. And the reason why they're so, much, they're so sensitive is because they have such small volume. Okay, so that's, that, that's why these transition head sensors are the world's most sensitive thermometer. And, and that's how these guys work. And hopefully uh, I can, at the very end, I can go to my iPad where I can see much easier and I can try to align that for you if you'd like afterwards when we're taking questions. So you can see actually that under the magnifying glass. Okay. So finally, uh, if you noticed, this is this other room here. Uh, and we have these pumps. So here is this turbo pump on the wall. It's connected to that fridge. Uh, 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 this pipe goes through this huge concrete block, right? As you can see, uh, you know, a foot thick. And here is that turbo pump, which is pumping on that still. And the reason why this is over here is because we want to, this pump produces vibrations. Uh, sorry, you can see it. This pump here produces vibrations. And we don't want those vibrations to get to the crystal and get to the cryostat, where they'll shake that crystal around. And it'll again look exactly like dark matter hit it. So the big goal of my group, actually, is to try to isolate these detectors from the environment, both vibrationally via putting uh, huge amounts of, of, of um, concrete and keeping the pump well far away to internally in the fridge, we have a spring mass decoupler. So that detector is, is, is decoupled from the rest of the system and sort of just like floating around. Uh, and then finally, yeah, well, we're actually right now, one of the things we're starting to work on is we're, we're trying to figure out how if we clamp down all the rest of the lines that are going through, <coughs> how much decrease in vibrations do we, do we see? That's one of the tests we're actually doing right now in, in this run. And we're trying to see the environmental uh, vibration uh, suppression. So going back to the slide, that's only one of many things that uh, we uh, have to get rid of is these vibrational interactions. So uh, second on this screen, if you see, is uh, we, we have vibrations, but we also have EMI. So uh, when the undergrads, when they were here, when the undergrads would get out of class and they'd all be getting on their cell phones, we would see little, little blips on our detectors. And that's because again, all of that your cell phone produces uh, something like two gigahertz radiation and it interacts with some cell phone tower far away. And some very small fraction of the radiation was getting into our cryostat and, and then bouncing down and getting absorbed by our TSs and, and heating up our TS and looking like dark matter. And so uh, one of the things we have to do is we have to somehow filter and get rid of that. And the secret here, and this is again something I can't do because I'm, I'm underground, is uh, in the basement, is to make something like a Faraday cage. So if you guys have, have ever seen, uh, if you guys have ever had problems like with a cell phone in an elevator, uh, it's because an elevator can sometimes act like a Faraday cage. And that's like, just like a mirror. If you remember a mirror, how does a mirror work? The, those, that, those photons come and they scatter off of the surface of, of this box and they get reflected. And so they can't get in the box. They can't get where your cell phone is in the elevator or they couldn't get where this radio is. And that is actually the idea of, 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 of a Faraday cage. And 
Uh, so we design our system to be a Faraday cage. We actually have three Faraday cages. It's sort of like a Russian doll. We have a Faraday cage on the outside and another Faraday cage at 4 Kelvin. And then finally, another Faraday cage at the mixing chamber. And uh, we want to make sure that at every point, all that EMI radiation reflects out. And the one problem is, is that we have to get the signal out of the Faraday cage. And if you can get a signal out, that means you can get a signal in and that EMI can get in. So we have to be very, very careful with filtering every line that goes into those Faraday cages. And that's the second big thing that my group is currently working on right now, is designing the filters to put on every single line at every single one of those Faraday cages to have that very clean setup. So I think oh, uh, there's one more thing I'd like to say about going on the ground and then, and then I'm done and we can talk. So, Um, so after we've now, we made the detector, we've, we've made our setup, uh, you know, free of vibrations and free of EMI, free of, you know, uh, filtered out all of the, the, the random cell phone conversations. Uh, then we have one more thing, and that is that uh, from outer space, there's cosmic rays that are constantly hitting the upper atmosphere, and they produce muons, and they produce, they cascade and produce all of these particles. And so at the surface of the, of the Earth, something like one muon goes through your hand a second. And so if we want to get rid of that final background, then we have to go deep underground. And so uh, we put our detectors in various locations. So right now, we're running some detectors in a test facility in Sudbury, Canada, in one of the deepest mines in the world. It's actually the biggest nickel mine in the world is in Sudbury, Cal uh, Canada. And we have a little spot that we go there uh, called Snow Lab, where we have an underground test facility that looks very similar to what I have here in my lab, where we test detectors. And then in something like 2022, we're building a much bigger facility underground for Super City Mass Snow Lab to search for one to 10 GeV dark matter. And then in 2026, we're figuring out where we're gonna build another test facility uh, to search for much smaller, lighter dark matter which is between 100 millivy and one jeb, one GV. So that's the final thing we do. We go after we create these really awesome super sensitive detectors, then we figure out how to environmentally isolate them from vibrations and from EMI. Then we put them underground and we see if we see dark matter. So uh, that's the lab. So are there questions? So I'm curious about um, the process for collecting data with all of this equipment, doing this stuff all the time and detecting. OK. Uh, well, uh, you can see actually our data acquisition system. So uh, give me a second. I'm going to stop sharing. I mean, I, I, can actually, I can physically show you what it looks like. Uh, so, uh, so here are the wires. This is a little bit. Um, uh, so here is the. Oh gosh, that's a bad. That's a bad. So here is. Uh, this is connected. So these lines go uh, all the way to uh, to under. Uh, no, to the mixing chamber to the detectors that are at ten millikelvin, and then here in this box here we have a, a bunch of filters which uh, filter out all of those lines and make that Faraday cage. And then here we have it connected out. It comes out and it goes into our first stage preamplifiers, which are these lines here. And then finally, uh, we have our digitizer, uh, which is actually sitting in this crate in this computer right here. So we have a digitizer in that computer. And uh, so the so yeah, so the key is uh, actually I skipped the scap, but. Um, so yes, we just have an analog to digital converter and that converts those analog pulses into ones and zeros that we just put on a hard drive. And, and that's, the, that's the setup, Rachel. Cool, thanks. So I see a question in the Q&A that says, I recently learned how Faraday cages use Gauss's law. 
Do you ever need to get down with the calculations or just leave it to the detectors to isolate the system? Uh, so uh, let's see, yeah, so Gauss's law. Uh, so yeah, it's awesome that you guys know Gauss's law. Um, so yeah, so Gauss's law actually is, it's one of those subtleties. Uh, technically Gauss's law only works for static electric fields. And you have to use something that's slightly more advanced for, for EMI that's high frequency. But to first order, you're totally right. Um, so the only problem is, is that this is not a single cavity where you can draw your Gaussian surface inside the metal. Um, because we have that wire going out. We have that signal wire going out. And therefore, there is that small little area where that electric field can get in and out and where the E field isn't necessarily zero. And that's the problem. And, and that's why we have to filter this sucker like, like crazy. If we, if we didn't have to measure anything, uh, we could make a perfect Faraday cage. Uh, so I have, um, I see another question here. Thank you for that answer, by the way. Um, there's another question that's wondering, how big is your group? Like how many people are you working in? Are you working uh, with? Sure. So, uh, I, I think it depends on, on, on what you call my group. So I, I, my, my lab here, and my lab here is three grad students, uh, one postdoc, one research scientist, uh, Bruno. And then I also work, uh, as, as that's my group. I also collaborate then with Bernard Satellite still, who is a, an emeritus professor, as well as I collaborate now with Dan McKinsey, whose lab I just showed you. So I collaborate with Bernard on, on um, Super CDMS, and I collaborate with Dan McKinsey on the lower mass dark matter searches, Spice and Herald. And so, um, but yeah, so that's my group. And then uh, each of those experiments, uh, Super CDMS, the one to 10 GV search, it has something like a hundred people working on it across the across, across the Amer across America. Uh, so my group is only uh, you know something like a small fraction of that, so like five percent of that group. Um, and uh, Spice is much smaller. Spice really is only my group and and two other groups basically. Uh, it's 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 very small right now. Um, and I think that's actually one of those interesting things is that um, the lighter in mass you go, the the more sensitive your detectors have to be. But also this means that um, no one else has ever searched there before. So you don't even have to go underground. To do a world leading dark matter search at one GV, you have to go underground. So super city mass has to be underground. Uh, we actually recently just did a world leading dark matter search with uh, that detector actually I was going to show you, but you sort of saw, uh, that detector had a world leading dark matter search at slack above ground. And the reason why was because it was, it had such good energy resolution that no one could ever look for dark matter of that small of a mass bouncing off of those atoms. Awesome. So I think just like very quick, I see one more, we might have time to ask one more small question. Um, so someone was wondering, what is an example of another question we might want to know about dark matter? Uh, or another answer we might want to know about dark matter after we know how heavy it is? Ah, so if you just okay. have like a minute. Uh, sure. I mean, I mean, so probably the biggest one is, is, is how strongly it interacts and how it interacts. So uh, does it interact via, via spin, via like magnetic coupling somehow, uh, some second order magnetic coupling? Does it interact uh, via some kind of dark photon where we, just like we have photons, maybe there's a, a dark massive photon that couples us to the dark sector. And so we can distinguish, uh, for example, a dark photon, we can distinguish, hypothetically, let's say we saw dark matter. We could distinguish what the coupling was by interacting with different crystals. So if you wanted to say, does this interact via a dark photon, we would couple it to a polar crystal. That's something like sapphire, gallium arsenide, silicon dioxide, which would really interact strongly with that dark photon. And it wouldn't interact very strongly with something that's silicon. And so we could see how it interacts. And again, that's the story we want to know. So thank you. Uh, I think we're going to have to call this to a close. Um, thank you all who have joined us for this uh, tour. And uh, thank you so much, Matt and everyone on your team. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks.